Welcome to day 15 of Shaped by the Word. I'm Paul Kemp. I'm here with Matt Kresge and Katie Kresge. And we've been reading through the Gospel of Luke together. Uh, what a rich gospel. All of the gospel writers uh, take the material that they, you know, that they have from the life of Jesus and they shape it in ways to help us understand the depth of who Jesus is. And more than anything else, Luke wants us to know how Jesus is completing a story that's been told for, for centuries and for years and mm. even for millennia how God is redeeming humanity through the Messiah, through Jesus Christ. So he has a wonderful introduction, and you have the songs that begin, you know, the Gospel of Luke, that that take us back to the Old Testament and the expectation of the hope of the Old Testament being fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, Most of Jesus' ministry in in Luke is centered around Galilee, so he's as far from Jerusalem as he could possibly be, and that's where we are right now. Last week, we left you on Friday with John the Baptist. Even though he um, recognized Jesus from the moment he came on the scene, and even though he uh, saw the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus in the form of a dove, and even though he heard the voice from heaven, in the dark moment, he he had had questions, Mm -hmm. and he had doubts, and so he sent his messengers to Jesus and asked the simple question, are are you the one, or should we expect someone else? And Jesus, again, takes him back to the Old Testament. He said, you know the story, you know the expectation. And all of those expectations are being fulfilled. Uh, Maybe if your expectations are not being met, uh, the biblical expectations are being fulfilled in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so we pick up in the middle of chapter 7 and verse 24. uh, After the messengers have left, with their answer going back to John to reassure him, Jesus turns to the crowd And he describes John, and he describes him in in glowing terms. Uh, But before we read the passage, let's do as we always do. Uh, Let's offer this moment and offer ourselves to the Lord. Uh, Matt, do you mind? Yeah. Father, we are indeed grateful for your word, um, for time in it together to to read, um, to receive insight and wisdom, but much more than that, to to get to fellowship with you and be transformed by you. So we pray for that um, today, that you would use your word to bring about your purposes in us for your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Verse 24, chapter 7. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury or in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' word, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in law rejected God's purposes for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Jesus went on to say, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played a pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge for you, and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. Son of man came eating and drinking, and you say here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all of her children. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, but she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither one of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. 
Do not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. A couple of very wonderful stories uh, that Luke is using to pull together, you know, the story of, you know, Jesus uh, and who he is. We start off, you know, with, with John the Baptist. And even in the middle of his doubts, uh, you can uh, kind of get a sense, you know, when Jesus is speaking to his messengers, there's, there's just a slight, you know, tiny bit of rebuke in it. But when he turns and he talks to the crowd, he, he talks, you know, of John in, 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 in the most, you know, glowing, you know, glowing of terms. Mm-hmm. So it, it's kind of fun. What did you go to see? <laughs> did you get to see a weed, you know, you know a reed just kind of blowing back and forth in the wind? John's not like that. Mm. Did you get to see somebody who's very impressive in all their array? No, John's not like that. And he's not <clears throat> just a prophet. He's much more, you know, than a prophet. So it's kind of a fun little fun little section mm-hmm. there. I, I have to admit that this passage, like, it is kind of tough for me to understand. I guess it's mainly just what um, Jesus says about um, about how the, let's see, I tell you among those born of women, verse 28, there's no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Mm-hmm. Do y'all have thoughts on that? Because I've like been kind of reading and thinking through that, but I'm sure y'all have some good Well, insight. certainly we have thoughts on <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> Do, <laughs> you have, Do we have the right thoughts? Yeah. The right, the right <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, John is the very best that the old covenant could produce. You know, there are those who are as far from God as they could possibly be under the old covenant, thinking the rituals of the covenant would make them near to God. But uh, John and people like Zechariah, mm-hmm. people like you know Elizabeth and Mary, Anna, mm-hmm. uh, and Simeon, who we've already met, mm-hmm. are those who are genuinely living with devotion to God under the old covenant. And so uh, whenever you have John, Jesus saying, John is the very best of those mm-hmm. living under the old covenant. But the power of the new covenant is so much greater than yeah. the power of the old covenant. So the greatest under the old covenant do not begin to match you know, what God is doing in and through those who have the new covenant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and John really I mean, serves as that prophet that kind of bridges the covenants. Right. You know, that he has like a foot in both worlds in, in a sense. And, and I think what you know, Jesus is doing, and, and I love what he does. He honors John, you mm-hmm. know, and for whatever reason, I, I always wondered, like, why, why did he wait till the messengers left? He, you know, he, he almost kind of wished that Jesus would have done it in the messengers. That's like I never compliment presence. you to your face, Matt, either. <laughs> I've been very complimentary of you behind your back. But, <laughs> but it's just like Jesus yeah. to, to kind of, I mean, doing what Jesus does, but then he, he lifts John up, he honors John, says John is playing a crucial role, and he points him back to, you know, Malachi. I mean, here, here he goes and shows us, He's fulfilled this prophecy, mm-hmm. but yet the the new covenant is a greater reality, and those who find themselves in that reality, you know, are yeah. greater than he. And mm-hmm. he doesn't get to see the full extent of the new covenant promises. Yeah, and, and one of the key phrases in there, uh, uh, "born of woman," mm-hmm. because those in the new covenant are not only you know born of flesh and blood, but also born of the spirit. Yeah. And so you know those uh, uh, it's absolutely commendable when you see. The people whom Scripture is able to say that they lived blameless and righteous, you know, before God uh, under the old covenant, without the advantage of the revelation of the Christ, without the advantage of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. uh, you know, without the advantage of, you know, the perspective that we had. Uh, so it is a very rich, you know, very rich, you know, compliment. Mm. Mm. That's helpful. Thank you. You, you know, you also get just kind of his Luke's commentary and. Even the rebuke of the Pharisees, you know, that if, if John was great, if those who are, you know, the least in the kingdom are great, yeah. the ones who stand outside of it are the ones who boast in themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, and in fact, even so much so that Jesus would identify, or I guess Luke in this sense, that but the Pharisees and the experts of the law rejected God's purpose. They didn't reject just John, but mm-hmm. their, their rejection of John, they're rejecting God's purposes. You know, so the ones who thought they were upholding the purposes of God and, you know, and the old the covenant, yeah. I mean, are actually find themselves rejecting God. And, and of course, that purpose was to repent, you know, of your sin yeah. and of your idolatries and of your covenant unfaithfulness and, and to turn to God yeah. in order to receive from him, you know, the gift of grace 
through his Messiah. Yeah. Which obviously and, turns us inward to our own hearts, oh, you yeah. know, because I, I think sometimes we read the the Gospels as if the Pharisees are the enemies or the bad guys, and it's like, man, they're just always standing in opposition to Jesus, and yet I, I think when we read it carefully, we find that we're probably much more like the Pharisees than we are the tax collectors and sinners yeah. most of the time, Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's a call to us, you know, are we rejecting the purposes of God by not repenting, by not receiving grace, you know, by looking to ourselves and by having such a great salvation and uh, yeah. not relying you know completely on it and of course that's where his you know comparison is he said what you know with what should I compare this you know uh, generation yeah. uh, you know we, we play the pipe for you you didn't dance you didn't dance to our tune mm -hmm. you weren't sad when we thought you would be sad you weren't happy when we thought you should be happy and uh, you know it, it's mm -hmm. the whole idea uh, you know, of, are we going to let Jesus be the piper who sets the tune for yeah. our lives, or are we going to set the tune and invite Him to, to join us? So it's a it's a pretty rich image. And really, that there. the pride that you're seeing in that passage leads us so nicely into that next story of the woman, who comes as humbly as I feel like you possibly could, and then now how Baptist of you, <laughs> you skipped right over the passage about eating and drinking. <laughs> Uh, so you, you deny the freedom you know that we have both yeah. to eat bread and to drink yeah. wine. <laughs> That's uh, hilarious. But anyway, uh, Katie's actually a Methodist. Yeah. I thought just, I was uh, making yeah, such yeah, a yeah, good yeah, little yeah. segue. Into no, the you are making a great segue. <laughs> I, I kind of ran ran all over it. But the wonderful freedom we have, you know, the yeah. you know kind of the legalisms, you know, that uh, some of the Pharisees had. Uh, and the expectations, you know, that they had for Jesus, who had a lot of freedom mm -hmm. in expressing joy and eating with, you know, tax collectors and sinners, uh, and uh, how neither one could please them. You know, John was too much right. this way, and you Jesus is too happy. much this way. Well, I love how Luke, yeah. you know, frames this, too, because he says they, they say he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners, and Luke's going to go on to tell you a story that shows you he absolutely was a friend, but That's so right. much more. Mm -hmm. Katie's transition was, was going to be so much better, but we just kind of walked all over that. <laughs> you definitely don't want to leave that out. So yeah. sorry. Yeah. But, yeah, like, I feel like just um, you feel the pride but even in that passage that you just talked about, you can't make the Pharisees happy, you know, and there's there's just so prideful. And then you have the pride of Pharisees continued. And then I feel like contrasted with the humility of this woman and this this story of this woman just gets me. It gets mm -hmm. me because I I feel we actually talked about this passage with students a few weeks ago. And what struck me is. Um, that her sin is already has already been exposed to the world, so there is nothing keeping her yeah. from coming to uh, in this house of a Pharisee, right? And coming to Jesus, not caring about what everyone's going to think. She's already past that point. All she cares about is this: the object of her worship, the object of her sacrifice. Because right, that alabaster jar is a sacrifice, and she just she's single-minded. And I just I love it. I'm totally struck by it and really moved by it because you have her humility contrasting with the pride of the Pharisees. Yeah. And unfortunately, like Matt said, I see myself more in the Pharisees yeah. than, than yeah. in her. And how, how would we like to be known as like the woman who lived a sinful life or, you know, if Jesus would have known what yeah. kind of woman she was, that yeah. she was a sinner. That, I mean, her sin was on public display. Everyone knew who she was. And, and how would we like to know, like for some of our deepest, darkest secrets to get found out yeah. mm -hmm. and everyone then begins to identify us as that kind of sinner, yeah. you know, or that kind most of Most of us are, you know, I think we mentioned it, you know, this on Sunday as well. Uh, most of us are like Pharisees who have a respectable veneer. veneer mm. And we do everything we can to maintain that veneer. And sometimes, you know, to, to be exposed is one of the biggest gifts we can have. Right. Because when we're exposed, we find ourselves all equal at the foot of the cross. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's it's a beautiful picture. I love the irony of the passage. If he were a prophet, <laughs> he would, he would know, know yeah. you know what kind of woman was touching him. Or if he were a prophet, he might know exactly what you were, what thinking, you were thinking at the in moment. This moment. Yeah. Uh, which is you know, which is you know kind of fun. Yeah. And you, and you're right, you know, Katie, the, the moving story, and Jesus, you know, brings it to a point with a parable, and you know, everybody owes a debt they couldn't repay. Some people are aware. Uh, I, I don't think he's saying, you know, she owes more than you guys do, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I think Jesus is saying almost the opposite. But some people are deeply aware of how great the debt is, and when they're deeply aware, uh, I, I like the little phrase, you know, that Jesus says, 
all of her sins have been forgiven, which is demonstrated by her great love. Yeah. And uh, the, the salvation that has come into her is, is flowing out in turn when great worship and, and great love. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, uh, to weep enough tears to wash someone's feet. Yeah. And, of course, the alabaster jar we learned from the other gospel writers, uh, you know, was coveted by, you know, Judas because it was worth more than a year's wages. Yeah. Uh, a huge sacrifice and huge and huge love mm-hmm. and, and of course that's you know the question of the passage or we people who are aware uh, still trying to maintain that veneer or are we people aware of what's behind that veneer and how deeply w- how much we've been forgiven and, mm-hmm. and how deeply we should love the one it who teaches us something us. about the you know the savior who invites us to come to him you know that, that when we come to him in our sin with our sin you know in in expectation with faith, he won't reject us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, she brought all of it right yeah. there before him in the, in the right. midst of everyone knowing she was going to get judged and condemned. That's probably her first time in a Pharisee's house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's because there was a welcoming Savior. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Father, we thank you that you have received us in spite of our sin. Uh, forgive us for our smugness, where we look down on others and, and call them great sinners uh, when we, in fact, uh, have been forgiven much more than we could ever repay. Thank you for your grace. Help us to love much. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.